Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply. This video is to bring you a closer look at the Town Steel number MSE-R13SUS32D. This is a mortise lock, and that part number is going to tell us it's a mortise lock. It's going to tell us the function. It's going to tell us uh, the uh, trim design as well, and then 32D tells us the finish. And let's just start with a visual tour. This is the Mortise Cassette. If you're old enough to remember cassettes, um, if you're old enough to remember 8-tracks, then you're old like me. Um, they call it a cassette, because if you use your imagination, you can kind of see why it would be called a cassette. That's going to fit into a cavity that will it will fit into very nicely. And this will ship from the factory. This happens to be... I believe this is a right-hand reverse. No, they've got left hand here. Um, left hand. Yes, that makes perfect sense. This is a left hand. I'm looking at the bolts that are down in here and how they'll affect the hubs. This is most definitely going to be unlocked, pardon me, locked on the outside when the bolt is thrown. Or however that's going to, well, it, it's locked when that or the stop works is thrown. Um, when you throw the thumb turn on the inside or the key, it will unlock that, allowing you to rotate the trim. The inside would be um, in an unlocked state. So this is the mortise cassette. This is what would be called, they, uh, Town Steel calls it a dormitory exit function. Other manufacturers might call this a corridor lock. What's important to know is that this is an F13. That's the ANSI number. That's the 13 in their part number. I like Town Steel in the sense that, well, for a number of reasons, but it's easy to know their part numbers because, pardon me, it's easy to know their functions because they're using the ANSI function. It's an F13 function. That is the same whether it be by Town Steel or Schlage or Sargent or Best or Corbin Russwin or anyone else who adheres to ANSI standards when it comes to functions. And that's what nice is nice about that. Let's take a look at the rest of the material. This is going to be an escutcheon trim lock. Here's your exterior. Here's your interior. Where your levers are going to go. And then, of course, your cylinder. Let's take some basic dimensional properties here. We're going to go with them being the same dimensions. Large piece of stainless steel is what this is. Overall height, about 8 inch, just heavy on 8 inch. Overall width, about 2 and 3 sixteenths. Overall projection of the escutcheon is about 9 sixteenths. This is going to include, of course, also in the part number, is this typical, most common of all handicap compliant levers. Okay. That is... Uh, definitely going to be um, that just sneaks inside of there so it's going to look like that it, I'll take it apart if you didn't see what I did it just comes like that that's how that's put together okay well actually what's going to happen here is you're going to put this well we'll go over the installation instructions but this will go down first and then you're Discussion plates will go over the levers. A uh, couple of dimensional properties of that, just for the sake of putting it into context. Overall width of the lever looks like it's about 5 inch. Um, it's going to have a total projection from the face of the door right at about 2 and a quarter with a clearance of about 1 and 7 eighths. It's going to be returning back to the face of the door within a half of an inch, which is typical for handicap compliance. Then there will be some accessories that are included, uh, other pieces that you'll need. This isn't a Schlage C keyway, by the way. And since we're talking about the cylinder, it has an inch and three-eighths long mortise cylinder. And that's because you are losing so much of it to the escutcheon itself. So inch and three-eighths, that was about nine-sixteenths. So that's about 13 sixteenths, and that's about perfect um, for a length of a cylinder. What I mean is, if the door is inch and three quarter thick, half of that is seven eighths. I'd like for this end of the cylinder to just be shy 
of that 7 8 center line by about a sixteenth of an inch because if I had a double cylinder I'd want a little bit of breathing room between the two of them no more than an eighth of an inch no less than a sixteenth of an inch and if you're gonna lose about a half of an inch here or nine sixteenths inch and three eighths minus nine sixteenths is thirteen sixteenths mm -hmm. Half of the door thickness is 7 eighths, less a 16th is 13 sixteenths. So this is a great length for that. They've got that figured out really well, obviously. Then, of course, you'll have the armor front. Now, the armor front is, is it, it, it's a trim plate. There's no doubt that it's a trim plate, but it's more than that. If you looked at a mortise lock, if you looked at a lock catalog from a domestic manufacturer, say Corbin or Sargent or Yale from 1905, or 1920. Well, 1920, I think you'll have both designs. Maybe one from, you know, turn of the, you know, you know, 19th to the 20th century. The edge of that mortise lock would be like 5 16 thick, just a piece of steel. There would be no edge plate on that. If you look at an old, old, a Yale mortise lock, that's what it's going to look like. Well, two problems with that. Um, it didn't give you an option really of a finish because that was just a big piece of steel. Well, this thin armor front, that's what this is called. It's an armor front. Um, allows me to swap that plate out for different finishes. You want stainless? Great. You want oil rub bronze? Great. You want polished brass? No problem. You swap this part out and it screws. So that makes it convenient. Uh, and of course, hardware has marched toward convenience ever since the dawn of hardware. Uh, sometimes in an extremely good way, other ways, in my opinion, less so. Um, here's an example of that. Here, here, let me just say, convenient, not convenient. Better, in my opinion, not better. Better would be the fact that I can reverse this mortise lock. I can make a left into a right, a left into a left reverse, a left into a right reverse, whatever I need, I can do that. In my opinion, I don't compromise the quality or the caliber of the security of this lock at all by having the ability to move these screws around and to move that latch bolt around with that small set screw. Okay, And, and I'm not done about the armor front yet. The way I don't like is they give you this big giant strike. Big giant hole here. I don't like that. Not every lock has a deadbolt. Why have such a large hole when a non-deadbolt function like a passage doesn't require it? Well, it's convenient because now it's completely non-handed. I don't care. What hand do you need? Here's your strike. It's going to work. So that, to me, I don't like as much. Um, it, maybe it's not so awful when you install the uh, dust box that's behind there, but I don't like that big giant prep. And when I specify a mortise lock, if the manufacturer has a handed strike, I will always put that in the part number because that's the way I'd like for it to be. Now the armor front. Um, the practical problem that this solved is this. What do you have access to inside of when you remove this plate? You have access to the set screws that hold the mortise cylinder in. In those old style mortise locks, those holes for the set screws were, were breaching right through the front of that thick plate as well as, well as the screws holding the mortise cassette to the door itself. If I had knowledge of the lock and if I had determination and the tool, I ought to be able to back that set screw off, thread that cylinder out, and then you saw what I did earlier. Okay. I get my lock in there, and with this lock, I'm unable to lock, unlock the lock. I don't have to necessarily draw the latch bolt back with my finger because when I've got that deadbolt, sorry, finger's getting fatigued. When I've got that deadbolt brought back, I can now rotate the trim and get in. When you take this armor front and you put it over there, you protect the head of all those screws with that armor front. This is the way that locks are, are manufactured today. There are some people who will make those old style mortise locks, but they're marketed as replacements for those old style mortise locks. They're not eight inch tall, inch and a quarter wide, things of that nature. Nor are they probably fire rated. Um, all of the accessory hardware is going to be bolts and spindles and whatnot. And I won't take all of that out. Well, I'll show you the spindle. There are different types of spindles. There's a swivel spindle. 
There's a split spindle. There's a solid spindle. There's also a triplex spindle, which is really a split spindle. This is what's called a swivel spindle. And you get one guess why it's called that. It's because it swivels. This allows independent operation of the lock. If this was a solid piece of 5 16 key stock, if the lock was locked, you couldn't exit from the inside. But when you lock the lock, the outside is rigid because of the hubs that are inside that mortise lock with those two screws. But the inside will always rotate to allow you to get out. A split spindle is a design of spindle where there are multiple pieces that are put together. Imagine if I took this square and cut it into three triangles. You can do that. You can cut, you can, you can get basically um, three triangular shaped, although they're not equal. You can get a, a small um, perfect triangle out of one piece and then have two isosceles triangles. Don't quote me on, on referencing my mathematics from many years ago. Um, the design of that spindle, and Yale had one, they, they called it the triplex spindle, I'm quite sure. Inherently the problem with spindles um, is this this will not let's see here now. This is not going to succumb to that problem at all. But in residential locks, you ever have a lever or a knob that's come loose and you're always tightening up that spindle? It's because the set screw, pardon me, tightening up the set screw, the set screw gets loose on that spindle. The I'm familiar with the Yale triplex cylinder uh, spindle from probably the 19th century. Um, when you tighten that set screw, it forced that perfect triangle up and then separate those two isosceles triangles. That's a split spindle. That held it on really nice. There are manufacturers. MTech has a design that is in that same spirit so that when you tighten up the set screw, it will flay the spindle out ever so slightly, anchoring it down. This mortise lock and, and many other mortise locks don't have this trouble because you're not securing anything to the spindle. You're bolting the trim to each other back to back. The spindle just happens to be along for the ride. It can't move in or out or get lost in translation. Everything else is going to be just screws for the mortise body, screws for the strike, screws to connect the discussion plates together, and then screws to mount the trim back to, get, back, to back to each other along with the Allen wrench that you would need if you need to reverse the hand of the lock. And um, we can certainly demonstrate how to reverse the hand of the lock, and I imagine that we indeed will. Uh, finally, there are the installation instructions. What I like about this lock is there ain't much to it. That's a hallmark of, let's say there are four sections. Cover page, that's nothing. That's 25%. Another 25% just shows you how to rehand the lock. What's in here are just basically a parts drawing for escutcheon trim and sectional trim. This here, this visual, is really all you get. And I would argue it's really all you need. Not much to this. If you can follow that, you'll be able to get it together, get it on the door. The only thing you need to make sure is that when you're done, it works. And what I mean by that is, Make sure you've not over-tightened screws with your 18-volt cordless drill. Make sure that the cylinder and the key works smoothly, that it latches, that you can retract the deadbolt without any trouble at all. I guess what I'm driving at is when you have installation instructions that are so spartan, in a good way, possibly, like I said, make sure everything works smoothly. The, when, you, when you rotate the lever, make sure it comes back. Make sure it, whoa, mommy, sorry. Make sure it comes back to exactly where it needs to be. A lot of spring tension there. Um, make sure that it ro retracts the latch bolt. Make sure that when the door closes, it latches. Um, one nice thing about this strike, even though I don't love the design of the strike, is they've got all these nylon inserts here that are gonna really serve to re reduce friction. You know, let's say that you've got an exterior door and it's got weather stripping, curved in style weather stripping. Well, that weather stripping, the door comes and closes and then the weather stripping pushes it back. One downside of this type of design is when you look at a strike plate for a mortise lock that has a deadbolt, 
the center line of the latch prep and the center line of the deadbolt prep are not on the same center line and that's because they relieve or they bias that deadbolt prep towards the outside a little bit because they know that you're going to close the door the weather stripping is going to push it out a little bit and when you go to throw the deadbolt or retract the deadbolt you don't want the deadbolt grinding against the inside face of this so they bias that this design does not incorporate that they might account for that by this being wider than it needs to be who knows um, not to be too pedantic about it but like I had said earlier sometimes when you evolve locks you do so better and you do so for for maybe for not better so what I'm stammering through is sometimes they evolve it in, in a way that improves the overall design and in other ways, they, they compromise what could otherwise be better. Um, and that would be an example of that, most certainly. So the most important thing is that it closes and latches and that you can operate the lock without any friction. And if you have any problems like that, test your installation. But you could have a door that's not fit very well um, in addition to all of that. The classic you know, file, the strike plate, that's not going to work with this. So everything's got to be mortised, machined hung true plumb level and square the whole nine yards it has to has to be ready to work um, and this lock ought to go in very well the only other document here is the template i like the template in the sense that what do we get here mortise template i think what they're showing us here is either a right hand or a right hand reverse yeah that's what they're showing here so on this hand, this side, it's a right hand or a right hand reverse. This side is a left hand or a left hand reverse. Then, and Tom Steele's not the only people who do it, then they have the legend that's here. These are the, depending on your function, function 13, these are the holes that you're going to drill on the outside and on the inside. You're going to have the spindle hole and the screws for the trim all the way through. You're going to have a thumb turn on the inside. You're going to have a cylinder on the outside. What really helps when you do this work, actually, because it's an escutcheon trim, you'll have these through bolt holes for the escutcheons itself. What really helps you when you are prepping for this material is understanding the function. What should it look like? On the outside of the door, I ought, on the outside of the door on both sides, I should have four holes. If you find that you're drilling a hole that doesn't make sense, stop. Check the template again. Maybe walk away and come back. Um, it's not so bad when you have an escutcheon and you drill that cylinder hole on the wrong side, uh, but you don't want to drill holes that don't belong there. You know, if you're supplying material to the job site and you're not installing hardware, the last thing you want to do is have a door with a hole in it that doesn't belong because you can guarantee the guy's going to call you and say, what's with that hole? Um, that's, that's not a good thing. So just double check it. I have found, I've machined for everything, every lock, every exit, every overhead stop, every panic device, every olive knuckle hinge, concealed hinge. The point I'm trying to make, pivots, I've looked at all these, I've looked at every template. Um, and there have been times I've needed to walk away. And you, of course, always measure twice and cut once. And it was the olive knuckle hinge that baked my noodle the worst. I looked at that template for an hour. I think it started to sing or whisper in my ear, but I got it right because I was um, able to focus on it. So the bottom line is... I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, you shouldn't be listening. Uh, the bottom line is uh, do a reality check when you're machining. Let's switch to the screen view. Let's look at all the supporting documentation and the extended description. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Let's dive into this lock that we're looking at. Um, speaking of looking at, let's look at some photos that I have posted down below. There's the box. There's the components of the box. A little closer up. Your trim, your escutcheons, the lock body, your cylinder and keys. That's a Schlage C keyway, by the way. Just a um, odd, not odd, but a town steel bow for a Schlage C keyway. There's your armor front, your screw package, your strike, and your dust box. You always want to install the dust box every chance you can, when, meaning you always want a dust box installed. There, it could be the frame you're installing it onto already has a dust box. You want to keep the particulate from the inside of the wall from encroaching into the living space. Here's our mortise lock. We have three more. There's your trim inside and outside. 
There's your levers, what they call their sentinel trim, shown top down, I suppose, and then elevation perspective. There's the rest of the parts. You can see that that cylinder looks a little long, and that's because it is. It's inch and three eighths, like we said before. These keys will have a code on it. It's what we would call a direct code. That just means um, the digits on there will relate to the depths of the cuts on the key. And it is a six pin length cylinder. And that exhausts all the photographs. Now, let's take a look at the extended description information. MS series mortise lock designed for high traffic commercial areas such as schools, universities, office buildings, and industrial complexes. 40 types of trim combinations available in eight different architectural finishes, available with clutched and regular configurations. This is a grade one lock, which means it's passed a million cycles and is uh, approved for use on an up to three hour fire rated applications. It's a single cylinder means there's a key on one side of the door only. This is an R escutcheon. MS is your lock. There's your escutcheon. There's your function. So MS escutcheon, R style escutcheon, 13 function, S for sentinel uh, lever is what that is. That's how we dissect that part number. There's your trim, there's your, there's your lever. That's what it would look like in a sectional trim. Just imagine that inside of here, obviously. Your handing chart. This is fully reversible, but I would encourage you to simply order the hand that you want to save yourself likely the steps it would be required that it would take to rehand the lock itself. Keying can be done either at the factory or here by us. We are uh, fully capable of doing any sort of key work that you need internally uh, when it comes to these locks. Two keys are included as standard with the lock. We can cut more for you if you like. Stamping is also possible. The cylinder can be stamped on the back of it, concealed stamping. The key can be stamped. You might want some sort of a direct or indirect code or a SKCS, a standard key coding symbol from the standard key coding system. Okay. Inch and three quarter door thickness, two and three quarter back set. We'll talk about that when we look at the template. The latch bolt is stainless steel split anti-friction. What they're saying there is that this latch bolt is of a multi-piece design. This piece right here is what makes it split. Four and seven eight strike. That is going to be the standard height for a steel frame. Inch and a quarter. What they're saying with that is they are referring to the center line of the hole to the edge of the lip. That's an important dimension to always know and to specify because you might need a lip length other than inch and a quarter. It's unlikely that you will, only because it's less common that you'll need uh, a lip length different than that. But what we're trying to show you on that is... Okay, here's our door. You have an inch and a quarter lip. That's going to work out just fine. It projects out just enough from the face of the frame so that the latch bolt will indeed um, make contact the way that it ought to. Well, let's imagine that we've done something like we've added... I'm, doing a pro I'm looking at a project now where they are literally adding two inch thick casing on one side, you're going to need a lip length that's going to get you out further. There's no doubt about that. So now that inch and a quarter is going to need to be substantially greater. If that material, and, and literally the job has two inch thick casing on one side applied, and the reason is, is because it's matching a detail that they're doing on the rest of the wall. Actually, I believe it's inch and a half is what it is. Uh, we'll pull that up and we'll take a quick look at it. Okay, I have that drawing pulled up, and I'm going to drag it down here so that we can look at it. 
is a great example. So they're holding it back a quarter inch. Yeah, for sure the latch bolt is going to hit the wood trim that they're doing, which is inch and a half. So this is what would be called a head section. Um, head detail, right? There's the three-quarter casing on one side, and they're doing this inch and a half on the opposite side because they're doing that on the rest of the wall. Well, yeah, this is a great example of where you've got to think about what lip length. You know, it's uncommon, uh, even for industry experts, to always remember the lip length, but this is going to require a custom lip length. This is the head detail, but the jam detail is going to look just like this. Well, not necessarily. We don't know that. Um, but we're going to assume that it will because it's the only detail actually on this page um, from the client. So that's where that's going to come in. You're going to need to think about what length that you need. You know, you'll encounter the same sort of scenario in other applications as well. There might be a wall condition that's been put here. You could also have... a wood frame and you just have an incredibly deep inset. You know, you could have a frame that looks like this and this dimension happens to be 18 inch. It could happen. It's not common, but I've seen it. Okay, well you need a long lip. That's on the strike. Anyway, that's that's what we're talking about when um, it's being declared what, what that dimension is. And that's the center line of the hole to the edge of the lip. We're also saying that the, uh, the faceplate, what we are calling armor front, that's inch and a quarter wide. Mortise locks can have narrower armor fronts. They do exist. If you have an inch and three eighths thick door, there are mortise locks um, or variants of mortise locks with the right parts that will fit onto that thickness. I doubt Town Steel offers anything like that. Um, there's your size of your escutcheon, talking about different lever designs. The thumb turn is available um, with variants as well. We'll look at that when we get to the uh, documents. Finishes are listed satin chrome, satin nickel, satin bronze, oil rubbed bronze, Satin stainless, polished brass, satin brass, polished chrome, polished stainless are all listed there. Most ANSI functions are available. Speaking of ANSI functions, I do wish to drive home that point of F13. As I pull up another catalog, bear with me. Um, so I'm pulling up the Schlage catalog just so that we can have something to compare to. So when they say it's a 13, it's an ANSI function, F13. If I pull up a, another lock manufacturer's catalog and type in F13, I'm going to find F13. Bear with me. So here is Schlage's description of F13. The point is, is I can take that number, that ANSI number, and open up, like I said earlier, anyone's catalog. So Town Steel does a nice job. I don't need to know what this is. I, 9456, you know, that's, okay, it's a corridor lock. It's described like this. But if I'm using the ANSI number as my code for the function and my part number, yeah, I don't have to remember this. And then the same part number by Yale, Sergeant, Corbin Russwin, on down the line. So that's a neat feature of what Town Steel is doing. You can get this with uh, without a core, with, pardon me, without a cylinder. You can get it with a small format interchangeable core. And because it's a mortise cylinder, as long as you can get a tailpiece, pardon me, as long as you can get a cam, you can run any cylinder into this, high security or otherwise. It's a Schlage C keyway. Code compliance is here. We've gone over that. Handicap compliant. It is. 10-year warranty. Now, those 
documents that are here. Let's take a look at those as well. And let's just dive into them. Here's how to order. All of the documents that we're about to look at from Town Steel, they're brief. They don't go on and on. They're easy to wrap your head around. This just gives you the step one, step two, and so on. Okay. So literally select your trim, what it's going to look like, and we'll look at the catalog in a moment. Your function, specify your lever, your finish, and your hand. Supplied with a lead plate for a lead lined application, that would be quite uncommon for you to order that, but not impossible. And it's going to look like this when you're all done, so that's nice and easy. Template, let's not look at the template just yet. Functions, okay, so we've got a 13 function, F13. Latch bolt operated by lever from either side. Deadbolt projected by key from outside and thumb turn inside. Operating inside lever retracts both bolts and unlocks outside. That's called an operational description, what, what I just read. They call it a function description. You always state, if you're going to write an operational description, you simply describe the lock in simple terms without using any fancy language, like industry language, like egress. You know, you wouldn't say latch bolt operate, um, deadbolt projected by key from access side and thumb turn from egress side. Don't, don't use those terms, just dumb it down a bit. Describe the lock in its standard state. What's it supposed to do? You know, what is it when you walk up to it? How does that state or function change? And then you probably always want to list what you do to get out and when it comes to electrified hardware and writing an operational description for electrified hardware stating that component is how that's done as well all of their other functions are listed here so if you're not sure if that's the one you need take a look at others now why you may not use an F13 is only because when you exit it's now unlocked automatically unlocked you have to manually lock it when you pull that door closed every single time. That may or may not be what you want. If it's not what you want, look at the F12. Operating inside lever retracts both bolts and outside remains locked. So activating the inside does not automatically unlock the outside. So these functions are there. There's a lot of them uh, because it's a mortise lock. Uh, what I mean by that is a mortise lock case, mortise locks, have a lot more potential functions than cylindrical locks because you've got this big giant piece of material to stuff parts into. There's lots of pieces in this lock. Um, so you can really, you know, you'll create dozens of different lock functions. Okay. Four pages worth here. Let's also look at handing. It's important to know um, in the sense of knowing what the handing is. Order the lock the proper hand, and they will endeavor to ship it to you in that hand. If they don't, you've got the installation guide. We'll look at that right after the product brochure. This is what you will be able to review to determine what trim you like. MSS-R, there you go. You want the escutcheon? There it is. That's the MSE-R. That's the escutcheon. Doesn't tell you the lever. The lever on this is the T lever, and as you scroll down, you'll get the concept. Those different thumb turns can be uh, are available on sectional trim. This is sectional trim. The trim is in sections rather than one piece trim like an escutcheon. And then there are your levers. We're doing the S for sentinel, and there it is. Then an overview is here as well. Basically, we've taken this document and somewhat chopped it up a little bit. Let's look at the installation guide. Um, okay, so showing you how to reverse that. If you need to flip that around, use the controls, controls in your web browser to do so. I'll demonstrate that on camera. So I won't worry about showing you that now. We're doing an escutcheon. So it's all right here. Prepare the door per the template. We'll look at that in a moment. Insert the lock case into the 
cutout that's been done and attach the lock case to the door, I suggest that you leave the screws about a half a turn loose. Um, that makes putting the cylinder in and everything in a little, little easier when you have that lock case a little loose. Insert the inside and outside spindles, 5 and 10, um, through the lock body itself. That's going to be important um, to put together correctly so that you can achieve that independent operation from each side of the door. What I mean by that is when you insert the spindle, be sure that you have the ability before you close the door um, and get locked out, uh, hopefully not, uh, that it works correctly according to the operational description. Insert two mounting posts, item 15, through your inside discussion. Um, yeah. So the mounting posts go through, 15. Then we've got this part 9 over here. Position outside assembly onto the mortise case, line up spindle and mounting posts with the mortise lock. Position the inside lever assembly, which is item 6, which is here. Using the two mounting screws, 9, that will be on the inside, those, the male portion of those bolts. Tighten that, uh, attach all that together. Um, I would personally leave it slightly loose at this moment. At this point, you've got everything kind of loose. Make sure it works. I would first put the cylinder in. No, no, forgive me, you don't put the cylinder in. Make sure that it works correctly at this point. At this moment, I would then, if it works correctly, I would tighten the lock case down, I would tighten these screws down, and I would make sure that it still works. Then you're going to install your inside and outside escutcheons. I showed you how to turn that around over the lever trim itself. And then you fasten with the screws, the number eight screws that will go through the inside escutcheon into the threaded posts and the outside escutcheon. Optional screw in cylinder. Okay, so if you've got a keyed lock, a single or double cylinder, this is where you install the cylinders and then tighten with the set screw. The teeth are be, to be pointed towards the up top of the door. Otherwise, it's just not going to work because the cam will be in the wrong orientation. Uh, if it's sectional trim, you're going to need the collar. If it's an escutcheon trim, you won't use that um, at all. Get it down to the proper depth. Um, a, tighten the set screw that will hold the cylinder in place, then test operation. Once you know everything works, put on your armor front. Tighten that down completely with the two small 832 by half inch screws. And then check operation prior to shutting the door. They're telling you right here, don't get locked out. Make sure it all works. But at this point, you've got everything attached. And it should work fl uh, very fluidly at this point. Now, the template, in terms of how you're going to prep it, we kind of touched on that before. This is... This is either going to be a right hand or a right hand reverse. The second page is either a left hand or a left hand reverse. Then you simply pick up your function chart again and decide what holes you have to drill. We're doing a 13 function, so I need the lever hole, cylinder hole on the outside. On the inside, I need the lever hole and thumb turn hole for the inside. Um, and if you recall, this client's doing a left hand, so we'll just stick with the left hand. The outside will get this. The inside will get this. You'll do this through the door. We're doing escutcheons, so you're going to do this 5 8 hole and this 5 8 hole. Very easy to lay this out because the top of the door, let's say to the top of your mortise pocket, will be a specific dimension. You've got an 8-inch tall mortise pocket, so add 4 inches from the top of the door to the top of the pocket, and now you have your center line. Everything that you're going to drill now is referenced off the center line of the lock. Inch and a half down. We said it was 2 and 3 quarter back set. That is true. Um, I don't see where they're referencing 2 and 3 quarter, but 
it's really important to know the following. I'm going to rotate this. They're showing you high bevel and low bevel, and then flat no bevel. This template that comes with it with the lock itself is a full scale, full size paper template. You'll attach that to the door. Back set is defined like this. What I've drawn here are four different door edges. Square, rabbited, radius, beveled. Backset is the dimension from the center of the thickness of the door. Okay? To that hole. Two and three quarter from here to the hole is different than two and three quarter from here to the hole. That's why backset is the center or of the thickness of the door. That means it doesn't matter how thick the door is. So what they're showing you there is be really careful whether or not you're using a, uh, a beveled door or a non-beveled door. And if you're doing it, if you're marking this on the push side or the pull side, if it's a beveled door, the high bevel or the high side will always be the pull side if it's a beveled door. The point is, is if you're going to lay this out by hand, it's two and three quarter from the center of the thickness of the door to that vertical line, two and three quarter. Set, uh, horizontal, pardon me, vertical center line, inch and a half down, two and three quarter from the edge of the door, which is defined as the center of the thickness of the door. Then you'll have this hole. Then from here, 1930 seconds, 1930 seconds, you'll get all your other holes. Um, the 5 eighths through hole, where are we getting that from? Here we go, all the way on the outside. So center line of the uh, lever down inch and 25 30 seconds then you're gonna hop up one in 25 30 seconds so six and 25 30 seconds will get you up here so all the dimensions you need to lay this out is here what I do when I prep these is I lay the door in the flat I put it on some sawhorses or whatever I will then lay it out with my um, triangle my, my mechanics triangle I'll know what my back set is and then I will mark everything with a pencil and we'll double check, and once I know I'm correct, I come back with the center, my hammer and center punch. I center punch all the holes. I flip the door over. I center punch all the holes. I stand it up or whatever I'm doing, and then I start drilling. That's how I do that. Pretty easy stuff. It's easy once you've done it. If you've not done it before, simply walk through the steps logically. Do a reality check on what holes you need. You don't want to put the cylinder hole on the wrong side of the door. A left hand and a left hand reverse are two very different doors even though you will use this template for both, for a left hand or a left hand reverse. In a left hand reverse, this is the outside. In a left hand reverse, this is the inside. In a left hand, this is the outside, but now your bevel has changed. And this is the inside. You will never have, you, you I won't say never, but these two holes are mo almost likely, surely not to be on the same side of the door. There, can't, there would be a function where you have an occupancy indicator, maybe not by town steel, that requires this hole because when you throw the deadbolt, it will change the occupancy state of your indicator on the outside. And that thumb turn is what that keys off of. There you go. So hopefully that is relatively easy for you. Let's wrap up this video, but first click on the manufacturer's link as seen here. And that's going to allow you to pull up not only all of the town steel products that we sell by means of this horizontal navigation as seen here, but also a link to the manufacturer's website as seen here, as well as a link to the full product catalog. Let's wrap up this video on camera. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Now, as I said earlier, we're going to just show how we're going to rehand this lock. This client did order a left hand, which means cylinders on the outside, this hole's through the door, thumb turn is on the inside, those holes are through the door. So I'm going to put the spindle in on, the, on what would be the outside. I know it's the outside because of the orientation of the latch bolt. I don't know if it's a left hand or a right hand reverse at this point. Um, 
but I'm going to first establish what we're working with. So the deadbolt's not thrown, which means this lever is going to be active, which it is, on both sides of the door. And I know that because I read the function, the F13 function. Yeah, so the lever, the lever works on both sides. Now, let's throw the deadbolt. There it goes. The outside should now be locked. It is. The inside should be un, should should allow us. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, the the inside should allow us egress, and it does. Now the final thing is, is the outside unlocked? Because I've unlocked the deadbolt. It is great. We know that this is a left hand. It was locked when the deadbolt was thrown. It was always unlocked, and if it was locked, it could unlock. So we know that we're dealing with a left hand. That means. Very simply, per the instructions, this is a left hand. You're on the outside. If I needed to change this to a left hand reverse, all I need to do is flip the latch bolt over. Because I still want, so right now this door swings, you're on the outside, I'm on the inside. The door swings like this. Well, if, this, if the door is actually a left hand reverse, it would swing like this. You're now on the, you're still on the outside but now the door swings towards you. I need to flip the latch bolt over. What they want us to do is use this Allen wrench. We're gonna, I think all we do is loosen it. I don't think we remove it. Okay, I've rotated that a bit and it's still not come out, so I'm gonna turn it out some more. Actually, the screw might need to come out substantially. And all I'm doing is rotating it. Okay. Yeah, it does need to be basically removed. Okay. Pull that out. Flip it over. Get it put back in, but we have to make sure that this little elbow here goes inside that mortise case. There we go. Now we got it. And all I need to do now is tighten that set screw back on this side. Now we've flipped it from an in-swing to an out-swing. And I'm just going to put it back together the way that the client ordered it. Since we've demonstrated that, I'm just going to tighten that set screw back up. And the post that, it, that the latch bolt connects to um, has a scalloped area around it that that set screw sets into to lock it in just like the side of the mortise cylinder so it looks like this where that set screw sets in okay we've got that tightened back up it works those two black screws that are back there would be nice if they took the same allen wrench since you already have it but it's just like a number one phillips so if we want to change this now this is the lock side of the door. If we want to take this left hand and we want to make this the inside of the door, which would then make it a right hand reverse. All we do is remove these two screws and put them on the other side of the lock case. I'm just going to remove them. So if I remove them completely, you're always going to have a passage set on those, on those hubs. So I've got the two screws removed from this side. I'm going to put the lock case down. I'm, going to, I'm just going to put it down. It's easier to do when I'm not holding three and a half pounds worth of steel. And what I'll do is I'll just tighten one screw. Well, no, I'll put them both in because it may work in one, you might be able to lift the lever up or, da, or only down if only one screw is in. Because that hub will allow the lever to go from, ver, from horizontal to down and up. So at this point, this was, the, this was the lock side, now it's the unlocked side. So what I should have now is a right hand reverse, which means this door is now like this. 
based on the orientation of the latch. This should be unlocked right now because our deadbolt is not thrown. The inside should be unlocked. It is because the deadbolt's not thrown. When I throw the deadbolt, the outside should now be locked. It is. Okay. The inside should allow us egress, and it does. That's great. So what we've done is we we have demonstrated how to reverse the hand of the, of the lock case. It's very simple. But, mo but most importantly, we have demonstrated that the lock works in the proper condition when we're done with what we're working on. You do not want to leave the job and not have fully t tested whether or not it works. I get calls from clients. Oh, I had a fellow one time with mortise locks um, not too many months ago, and he was... It was hard to get him to concentrate. He was the term beside himself. He was he was fit to be tied. He didn't want to talk about it anymore. It just didn't work. Um, and and he had been goofing with it for three days. He said he had like ten of these locks. None of them worked right. And what he was doing. And the moral of the story is: test it before you leave. If it doesn't work, then something's not right. What he had did. What he did was. You always want to be careful threading this in. I'm a trained professional. Um, and the reason is because it's easy to cross-thread this material. That thread is a 1 in 5 30 second diameter, 32 threads per inch. What the fella did was, now I've got that rotated in there to the point where it's going to work. Okay, the key works. You can see how that cam throws that. Okay. What the fella had, what the fella did, which he didn't mean to do, he just didn't know because he's not a hardware person. He threaded that as far as he could get it in. Wind it, it worked really nice, but he got to the point where it just wasn't working right. Why, why, why doesn't it work? Actually, he couldn't really get it turned at all because he had taken it so far that he backed it all the way out. He's like, I can't get the key to rotate, etc. And it took a, it, it took, it took a moment for me to help him analyze over the phone what was wrong because I was going through all the steps of my experience of installing mortise locks. What prevents the key from working? Well, the first thing I thought of, well, the cylinder's not at the proper threaded depth. And I thought, well, no, he would have figured that out. Well, 30 minutes later, I said, you know what? Let's try this. Loosen the set screw in the side of the cylinder, back that out two revolutions, tighten the set screw again with the key, with the teeth pointed up, does it work? Puts the phone down, he's angry, puts the phone down. And then I could hear him in the background, you know, like this, he was so happy. Um, so that, you know, all that conversation we had earlier about the length of the cylinder, uh, the problem that the client had was he, it was small format interchangeable core, seven pin the minimum length on those cylinders is inch and three eighths he had sectional trim he didn't have the right cylinder collar he didn't realize that with that cylinder you needed to stack cylinder collars together um or no not stack them he needed to use the largest of them um, and simply use the middle size so he kept rotating it until he sucked up all that space underneath the trim ring um, and just and that's what it was anyway uh, the name town steel is synonymous with imported uh, mortise locks like this their name is actually quite synonymous with ligature resistant material so if you're doing a project where ligature resistant trim uh, is specified the name town steel could be tossed about they definitely have a very mature and developed product line when it comes to ligature resistant hardware uh, easy to work with. They do have a very large order minimum. Um, obligating the factory to ship out just one lock is not something that I can do when it's well below their order minimum. Um, and if you're ordering two or three mortise locks, you'll certainly hit that order minimum, but one generally won't do it. It's a, it's a large order minimum. Be mindful of that. If you need one imported mortise lock shipped out and you need it shipped out quickly, it probably won't be town steel um, because of that order minimum. Anyway, they're easy to get along with, that's to be sure. 
Any questions on the town steel? This is their part number. MSE-R13S32D or any other town steel product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Again, thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.